Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the first workshop in the Revisiting Modern China in the Hoover Institution Library and Archives. I'm Eric Wake, I'm the Director of Library and Archives, and I want to thank everyone who <coughs> helped make this a reality, especially my colleague Chef Um It's a pleasure to have such an excellent, excellent large turnout for the first of this workshop. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Hoover Institution has been collecting materials on China since roughly 1899, when Herbert Hoover was in Tianjin and started collecting books and donated them to the Hoover Institution in 1913. So it's 100 years we've been collecting in modern China. And um, this collecting history continues today with the records of public servants, military officials, um, uh, engineers, journalists, and so on. Um, and some of you have been using some of our most popular collections, Chiang Kai-shek's diaries, um, papers of TV Sung and H.H. Kung, and um, many others. And I hope that we will continue using them all. And we thank you so much for, for coming out. It's my pleasure to introduce Ron Mitter of Oxford University, who um, has been a professor there for a number of years, and is here to speak on China's wartime history and contemporary East Asia. It's a pleasure to have him across the pond, as it were, to speak for us. Welcome, Professor. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. King. And thank you all of you for coming and spending your lunch hour um, here listening to a subject which I hope will be of interest to all. But if there is any downfall in terms of the quality of the material, I see that we still have a delicious lunch to uh, sustain. <laughs> I always thought that actually the American Constitution, which contains a line against cruel and unusual punishment, um, has always been exercised by universities which like to serve lunch at lunchtime seminars, which everyone except the speaker is able to eat. <laughs> so uh, I think it demands a particular level of rigor on the part of the speaker not to uh, break off from what's being said and instead turn to the uh, delicious Scorbridge shortcake and things which have been provided here. It's also a great pleasure to be here at Hoover since I am, uh, I say ashamed, I'm not ashamed at all, I'm proud to say, uh, this is by no means the first time I've been here. In fact, um, 20 years ago, less than that, but not that much less than that, um, I found the collections here of great use when considering a previous subject with some relevance to today that, uh, as we in China reminded me, um, I uh, wrote a book about uh, some 12, 13 years ago, and that was the subject of Manchuria and the Japanese occupation, on which there are a whole variety of extremely valuable and interesting materials here. So it's a pleasure to be back at Hoover to uh, explore variety of, uh, of other areas and to see that it continues as an immensely valuable and uh, immensely friendly institution in which to do scholarly work. I also want to use that sense of the Hoover's purpose, or one of the Hoover's purpose, uh, purposes, in terms of what I'd like to say today, because we've mentioned Herbert Hoover, um, former president of the United States, and also, of course, a man with, amongst other things, um, a, a global resume say, in terms of his uh, work in engineering and his work in uh, famine relief, and disaster relief, all of which have um, a great deal of things to say in terms of the way in which many of the materials held here at Hoover are relevant not just to scholars, but also to a whole variety of questions which are of great significance in the wider world today. I don't think that anyone could look around at the world of 2013 and think that whether it's connected to questions of geopolitics, or indeed of disaster relief, refugee relief, or questions of transnationalism, what can operate across national boundaries, and where is sovereignty important? All of these, of course, were immensely important um, 100 years ago when Hoover was uh, an important political figure. But also, of course, and perhaps more directly relevant to what we have to address today, um, relevant to China a century ago, as well as the China of today. So in the context of my remarks today, which are going to be about aspects of wartime China, China primarily between the years of 1937 and 1945, although at least some in the audience, I'm looking at Dr. Chan here, may want to start a debate later on about the question of those dates. I do think that the areas that I want to address are actually of continuing significance in a much longer and wider journey towards Chinese modernity, which began long before the war years, 
and I would say it's still very much um, something that we are engaging with today. So as I speak about those historical matters, I hope also to make some connections, in some cases perhaps provocative ones, which will enable us to talk about contemporary significance. I'm also aware that I'm merely the starting element, um, maybe hors d'oeuvre you might say, but something about lunch that makes one think about these culinary metaphors, um, in terms of two weeks of very exciting seminars relating to a variety of uh, historical issues relevant to this wider topic. So in that sense, I'm aware that I am only um, starting what I hope will be uh, a very fruitful conversation over the next fortnight. Can I ask if people can hear me, or should I use the microphone? I've realized, actually, that we do have uh, <coughs> it's fine. Is it fine? Okay. <coughs> That's a polite way of saying your voice is so loud that you don't need to, uh, to use a microphone. But if anyone fails to hear anything I'm saying, please do let me know and I will um, turn to the, uh, uh, the IT. Let me start by showing an image. Those who have worked with me previously, and I'm delighted that several uh, of uh, my uh, former Oxford colleagues are here today, will uh, know that I'm inordinately fond of this particular slide. But for those who haven't seen it before, I do think it is a wonderful um, image to symbolize some of the issues that bring together the past and the present in considering China's wartime history. I think, considering the audience that we have here today, nobody will need much explanation as to what this is. But just in case there are one or two who um, are not China specialists or um, uh, familiar with what's going on here, this is the DVD box of a uh, television show that went out in China in 2005. In other words, on the 60th anniversary of the ending of the Second World War, um, its Chinese aspect, of course, being known as the War of Resistance Against Japan. And as you can also see, the title of this show is Temporary Wartime Capital, which refers, of course, to the city of Chongqing the capital of former Chinese leader, nationalist leader, Chiang Kai-shek, where he essentially ruled in exile from the east coast of China between uh, 1937 and 1945. And I find this image very compelling, simply because it seems to me to have two levels of significance. The first and most obvious is, of course, the geopolitical. A television program made uh, less than 10 years ago in China, finally putting forward a very explicit comparison between these three great allied wartime capitals, to most Westerners familiar as the centers of resistance to the Axis powers, uh, the uh, Victoria Tower of the Houses of Parliament in London, of course, on the left, the Red Square clock in Moscow in the center, and the uh, US Capitol building, of course, in the middle. But towering above them, at least in this image on the right, we have, of course, the what is now known as the Jiefangbei, the uh, Liberation Monument, but previously the anti-Japanese Liberation Monument, established by the Guomindan government of Chiang Kai-shek in the center of Chongqing in 1944. In other words, the temporary wartime capital of China in the southwest, in the last desperate months of the war, this monument was erected, and it still stands there, of course, today. Those of you who have been to Chongqing, which is probably most people here will know that, first of all, it is not, despite the appearances of this image, twice as tall as the US Capitol building. Um, we have to just state that from the grounds of accuracy. But also, of course, it still stands there today, as it has since 1944, uh, now dwarfed, of course, by the many skyscrapers, like every other major Chinese city, Chongqing has built ever higher and higher. But um, this particular monument still stands there in the, uh, the middle, keeping faith, so to speak. And the explicit statement that China wishes to be and should be regarded as the fourth of the great wartime allied powers, I think is an important geopolitical statement, some aspects of which I want to explore in my remarks today. The second level of significance, which I also want to deal with briefly though, may not be so immediately obvious. And that is that I think that this symbolism is not just a message to the West and to the outside world, although I think it is certainly that. It's also a message to the rest of China. As you can see from the center of this uh, box, it was made by Chongqing, the um, Chongqing television station, <coughs> rather than the central 
television station in Beijing. And I think there is a strong element of local <coughs> pride going on here as well. The rehabilitation of a long hidden period of history, the history of Guomindan um, rule and resistance in wartime Chongqing, which can finally, after many decades, be discussed and indeed broadcast to the rest of China, providing implicitly, if not explicitly, comparisons with Shanghai, Beijing, and the other great cities of China as well. So I'd like you to keep that TV show and this DVD box perhaps in the back of your mind as we explore some of the questions that emerge from the new history and historiography of the wartime that has emerged uh, in the last 15 or 20 years, not least from many of the documents that will be held just a few feet away in this very building. But before we do that, let me just very briefly, uh, and considering the expertise in this, in this room, I will do so only very briefly, remind um, all of us what it is that we're talking about, because I think that this background is relevant not just to uh, today, but also to the seminars that we are going to have in the next couple of weeks. The experience of China's wartime resistance against Japan is finally beginning to be uh, recorded, not just in terms of new materials available both in the mainland and Taiwan, but also to be internationalized in terms of holdings, for instance, here at Hoover, also in places such as National Archives in Maryland, and of course the British National Archives in Kew, to give an ever fuller and in some ways ever more um, um, uh, poignant picture of what happened during the war years. The number of Chinese dead during the war is still to be absolutely resolved. It may never be resolved, but certainly reliable figures put it in the 12 to 14 million or more. Um, refugee flight has been the subject of considerable exploration from a variety of scholars. Uh, off the top of my head, Stephen McKinnon's recent book uh, comes to mind, in which 80 to 100 million refugees are estimated to have uh, fled at some point during the war years. And of course, more broadly speaking, the tentative developmental state that we seem to see in 1920s and 30s China, the tentative and very flawed modernization was of course destroyed in large part by the experience of the war against the Japanese. And it is a large part of that story, the attempt to try and understand the effects of the war against Japan on Chinese modernity, not just in terms of the story that has tended to be best examined in the last half century, the rise to power of the Chinese Communist Revolution, Still an immensely important story, but not the only story which we examine. And instead, look at it in a whole variety of perspectives. And of course, the Chiang Kai-shek diaries, <coughs> which many people in this room either have examined or will be examining in the, in the near future, have been a very important part of creating that new and more complicated narrative of what happened in China during the wartime period particularly as in this map when the um, outbreak of war in 1937 outside the Marco Polo Bridge near Beijing led quickly to the um, outbreak of all-out war between China and Japan and the occupation of much of the East by the Japanese and their collaborators, uh, the growth of communist presence in the North and Center, and of course the uh, nationalist Kuomintang uh, resistance in the South, Southwest and um, and center. And to that extent, the, the uh, book that I am about to publish in just a few weeks' time, it's already come out in the UK under a slightly different title, but will be out in the US um, in uh, just a month or so, is very much based on trying to look at three different models of Chinese modernity that emerged during the wartime period. One of those, of course, is the um, emergence of the Communist Revolution, in particular under Mao. Another, of course, uh, and again drawing on new material on Chiang Kai-shek, the alternative nationalist model of what a post-war China would have looked like, a country that would have been fiercely anti-communist, but also anti-imperialist in its own terms, and seeking a different sort of engagement with the world community. And finally, and not to be forgotten, the model that ultimately became politically entirely toxic, 
but at the time seemed at one point most likely to win, and that was of course collaboration with the Japanese, symbolized most obviously, but not only, by Wang Jingwei, the former uh, second in command, essentially, to uh, Sun Yat-sen, and a man who in his own mind sought an alternative vision of a nation state that would exist within the context of the Japanese empire, only of course, um, in his case, to be um, sorely disappointed by the reality of what collaboration with the Japanese uh, might, uh, might mean. So, <coughs> excuse me, let me use that to start to speak about some of the topics and the specific areas which I think the wealth of new materials that are available to us, not just here at Hoover, although they're certainly here, but elsewhere, enable us to do. And the first one enables me to make a broad statement, which I'd be delighted if we discussed or debated in the context of the discussion afterwards. And that is that I would say that the history of China's wartime experience is becoming, in terms of historiography, globalized and normalized. In other words, I think we are moving a little bit away from the idea that the Chinese wartime experience was purely distinctive, even though, of course, it was in a whole variety of important ways, as all wartime societies are, but rather to spot the many trends that are similar to those in the wartime experience of other countries involved or in, the, uh, in the war. And I think it's important to bear that in mind, simply because, as you will all be aware, there was a very long period in which China's wartime experience did not really figure into the comparative history of the war, either in the Chinese-speaking world or in the Western-speaking, uh, the Western English language-speaking world. Essentially, for a variety of reasons connected with the Cold War, communications across either the Taiwan Straits or the Western China were very difficult for a whole variety of those periods. Remember the uh, amazing scholarly efforts of a generation of scholars who were forced to deal with the history of China refracted through materials other than those available in China itself during the Cold War period, simply because of lack of access. And again, that remains one of the very important roles of centers such as, uh, as Hoover. But of course, the changes that began in the late Cold War and have taken off in a big way in the last couple of decades have created new possibilities for historical uh, investigation. And I would say that new trends in historiography have enabled us to think of the war of resistance in China, of course, as a transformative event for Chinese society and politics more widely, rather than simply being a way station on the path towards ultimate uh, communist victory in 1949. Um, and this has led to some of the scholarship that uh, has emerged in recent years, um, which re-examines in more nuanced terms the wartime record of the nationalist Kuomintang government. The negative side of that government is well known and indeed indisputable, a state and party that were hollowed out, corrupted by the years of war, with mass poverty, social deprivation, and highly exploitative tax gathering. And the work of the late Lloyd Eastman in the English scholarship remains one of the uh, important works to examine to uh, uh, see that particular viewpoint. But it's also, I think, more recently understood and taken on board that the experience of the war <coughs> at its end point in 1945 also raised China's global status in some very important ways. The country's undoubted contribution to preventing the Japanese from controlling all of East Asia meant that essentially its status as a semi-sovereign country, which it had had since 19, sorry, 1839 and the Opium Wars essentially came to an end, or in terms of the most obvious but also uh, significant um, element of that change in global status, it will not necessarily make you great friends to point out to top CCP officials today the reason that China has a place on the Permanent Five Security Council membership is because of Chiang Kai-shek and not because of Chairman Mao but it remains, nonetheless, a historically provable fact. Chinese historiography has, I think, begun to take on board the new interest in the post-war. 
In other words, looking at the effects of the wartime period as a means of understanding the uh, elements that changed in Asia in the immediate aftermath of the wartime uh, period. And it's worth remembering that that United Nations moment, the gaining of that seat in the permanent five uh, of the uh, UN Security Council, came as part of a short moment of assessment between 1945 and 49, when China, on the one hand, was clearly heading towards the chaos of civil war that eventually would lead to communist victory, but also, like much of the rest of the world, was entering a controversial and difficult period of <clears throat> reconstruction in which transnational and international involvement was a clearly very important part of the, uh, uh, the process of change. And nationalist China, until 1949, it's worth remembering, was also a prominent example, albeit a very short-lived one, of something at that point that was still very rare, a non-European nation-state which had successfully advocated a message of anti-imperialism, not only against the Japanese, most obviously, but also very strongly against the British. It was well known, it remains well known, that Winston Churchill was one of the least sympathetic figures when it came to Chinese involvement in the war. And once, as many of you will have done, you have read Chiang Kai-shek's diaries and his opinions on Winston Churchill, you will see that the feeling of, lo of loathing was entirely mutual. <laughs> and to demonstrate that, uh, that process, I'd like to now turn to some of the evidence that comes from the diary, which again, some of you will have seen, but perhaps not all here, which I think is very interesting. And that is one of those global moments that until recently has not achieved nearly enough prominence, but I think in future years is going to be re-examined as really one of those turning point um, uh, 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 moments that uh, deserves much greater attention. And that was Chang's visit to um, Chang's visit to India in February 1942, and his successful, to some extent, meeting with uh, Nehru, and his frankly not particularly successful, pretty unsuccessful meeting with Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, let's, um, yeah. Ah, that's right. I realise that my uh, picture here is an extremely uh, Poor quality, well, I apologize for that. <laughs> Just about, uh, not from a, a Hoover source, I think. Um, you can see in the middle we have Mahatma Gandhi. Here we have uh, Chiang Kai shek, and on the right we have Madame uh, Chiang Kai shek. Just a reminder about the context of this visit. Just a few weeks earlier, at the end of 1941, Pearl Harbor had happened, and China, the United States, and the British Empire were finally allied with each other formally in the fight against Japan although, of course, not at that point with the Soviet Union involved. And fairly soon afterwards, um, it became clear to Chang, at least, that a visit to India to try and encourage the pro-Indian independence leadership to back the Allied side in the war would be a very useful um, enterprise. This did not go down at all well with the British government of the time, but finally a whole variety of intermediaries, including the British ambassador at the time, Archibald Clark Carr, became involved in uh, uh, leveraging the visit, enabling it to happen. And um, arriving in Delhi in February 1942, Chang first met Nehru. Now, the two of them actually got on pretty well. Uh, unsurprisingly, perhaps, Nehru had visited China previously, including during the war in 1939, and had several quite positive meetings with Chang. And again, because of the way in which retrospective historiography has operated, it is worth remembering that whatever his other flaws, and they were extremely many in number, um, Chang's genuine sense of anti-imperialist uh, motivation should not be in any way under underestimated. And that particular connection made him and Nehru um, quite uh, 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 natural companions in that sense. Uh, we also know from uh, accounts of him, that Chang could never resist giving people a lecture about how he knew much more than they did. And this was also uh, what happened when he visited Nehru. Uh, his um, uh, meeting with Nehru and also with Malala Azad, one of the uh, Indian Congress leaders at the time, um, was uh, uh, along the following lines. He said, based on my revolutionary experience, you should not make mistakes in procedures or strategy. So uh, having, in his own eyes, previously undertaken a national revolution, which had finally uh, um, ended uh, warlordism, as he saw it in, in China, 
uh, Stalin was seeking to uh, transmit his experience to another set of anti-imperialist uh, uh, leaders. But having made these points, he did make it very clear that he felt that the very strong non-cooperation stance which the Indians were taking against the British ran the danger of endangering the Allied war effort. Again, you will know this, I'm sure, but just to remind you, uh, the then Viceroy of India in 1939, Lord Linlithgow, who was uh, not very much in favour of swift movement towards Indian independence, had committed India to the war effort against, uh, against uh, um, I think it was Japan at that point, but uh, essentially as part of the European war, without consultation with the Indian Congress leaders. And as a result, Nehru, Gandhi and others felt that it was um, uh, a calculated insult to their own status not to bring them into that particular discussion. And by 1942, the situation had become much, much more tense, particularly with the um, <coughs> obvious news that Asia was going to become part of the, uh, the war. Uh, within a few months after the, uh, the meeting between Chang and Nehru, in fact, the Quit India movement would begin, which essentially was the end point for um, uh, the British dominance uh, in India, which would end with independence in 1947. But at this point, in February 1942, Chang was still very much hopeful that his influence and his conversation would enable the Indian independence leaders to join in with the war effort. Um, he uh, was very keen to boost, in particular, the cause of the Indian National Congress. He was not at all keen on Jinnah, who was the leader, of course, of the separatist movement that Muslim lead that would eventually lead to Pakistan. And again, perhaps not surprising, that Chang, a leader who had spent most of his career uh, attempting to try and prevent his own country from splitting up into different regions, should feel so um, uh, uh, negative about uh, another leader who wanted to split up his own uh, country. But eventually, it was agreed that there should be some sort of forms of formal discussions between Chang and Gandhi. Um, Chang could see that Gandhi in particular was key to trying to get the, uh, uh, the pro-independence movement on board for ultimate um, support of the, uh, uh, of the Allies. And again, this was done with great difficulty because Churchill again sent a whole variety of messages making it very clear that he did not approve of Chang's trip in the first place, and he certainly didn't approve of him trying to see Gandhi. At first it was suggested that Gandhi should meet um, Chang at uh, his home near Bombay, and Churchill made it very clear that there was no way in which he would accept Chang meeting Gandhi as if he, Gandhi, were the leader of a sort of pseudo-government, a figure who should be given that kind of official status. Um, eventually they met actually at Shantinikatan, the uh, university founded by Rabindranath Tagore near, uh, near Calcutta. And on February the 18th, the two of them, Chang and Gandhi, talked for some five hours, um, with uh, interpreter, who of course was the only one who spoke both English and um, Chinese. Uh, there was also actually, I was later told, another visitor in this particular meeting, although you can't see him in the photograph, uh, and that is uh, Amartya Sen, the uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, who told me that at the age of about four, in fact, he was part of the greeting party, and uh, was uh, formally introduced to Madame Chang Kai-shek, who even at the age of four, he could tell, was clearly one of the most beautiful women in the world. <laughs> that's, uh, that's his memory from where he sits, uh, sits now, and I'm sure it's... Um, Entirely, uh, entirely accurate in every, uh, every way. But I think uh, Sen was not present at the, the more intimate uh, conversations. So the conversations were complex and interesting. Gandhi told Chang that he was sympathetic to the idea of a war of resistance against the Japanese, and he would not actively, in any sense, obstruct British Empire assistance to China. However, Chang also tried to float the idea of mutual cooperation. In other words, getting the Congress leaders to support an active role in the war against the, uh, against the Japanese. Gandhi did not reply directly, but of course, as one of the primary advocates of non-violence, uh, which was not shared by Nehru, this was a much more difficult position for him to embrace. And he did state that Chang, quote, should not force him to change his principles. Uh, and then eventually, after several hours, Gandhi did what he always did when he wanted to bring all the conversation to end, which was to turn to the uh, spinning wheel and uh, start uh, um, weaving some cloth. And Chang wrote in his diary that this was not a meeting that he felt had gone well. He said, after meeting Gandhi yesterday, I'm disappointed. My expectations were too great. 
but perhaps the pain of being ruled by the British has hardened his heart. He knows and loves only India. He doesn't care about other places or people. It's traditional Indian philosophy that has made him this way. He only knows how to endure pain. He has no zeal. This is not the spirit of a revolutionary leader. I judge that the Indian Revolution will not easily succeed. Well, you may, more than 60 years later, judge Gandhi's success and Chang's success and work out which, if either of them may have been right about that question. Certainly, Gandhi felt the same way. He wrote uh, to his colleague, uh, Balabhai Patel, uh, a little while later, I would not say that I learnt anything, and there was nothing that he could teach him. And um, Sumei Ling also then spoke in negative terms to Nehru later on about Gandhi, saying that she didn't think this was a technique that would succeed, which rather upset Nehru at the, uh, uh, at the time. However, the failure of this particular meeting, I think, obscures some of the importance of the, uh, the dynamic between the two. This was nonetheless a historically very important moment. During the age of high imperialism, for the non-European sovereign leader of a country, China, to meet a major independence leader at all was actually a fairly unprecedented moment. And in the context of, the, of a global war which had broken out at that stage, it really was a rather important um, moment, which again, had Winston Churchill um, and some of those around him being more savvy, frankly could have been leveraged in a much more productive sort of way. Um, this is not the kind of um, element of the war which tends to make it very much into the military histories of the period, since I think there is no arguing that the Chinese military contribution at this stage clearly couldn't match what you get from the other technologically enabled allies. But in terms of trying to change the temperature, trying to change the political climate, encounters of this sort, and there weren't very many of them, I think deserve much greater attention than they have been given until quite, um, until quite recently. And we should remember that, again, in a very public statement that has been available for, for, a long, for a long time, on the 21st of February of that year, the last date of China's visit to India, broadcast from Calcutta in uh, English by Sun Wei Ling, Chang again made a very bold set of statements with some interesting ideas put together in one speech. First of all, he reminded radio listeners about the rape of Nanking, the Nanjing massacre, which of course had happened uh, less than five years previously. In other words, a warning that his listeners in British India should not expect to place their anti-imperialist hopes in the Japanese. And of course, this was unstatedly um, a shot across the bows of Subhas Chandra Bose the Indian National Congress leader who had defected from uh, Congress after his quarrel with Gandhi in uh, early 19, late 1940, early 1941, and had formed a, um, an Indian National Army uh, in collaboration with the Japanese subsequently. So he did warn Chiang Kai-shek in this radio broadcast that if the Allies lost, then in his words, world civilization may be set back a hundred years. But he also, in a speech made a very explicit link between China's freedom and that of India, warning the British that they would be better off to give more real power to the Indians now before the Indians made those demands themselves, once again leading to outrage, fury, and spluttering from Winston Churchill, who did not like this message at all. But considering that within a few months, the Quit India movement had begun, which both Indian independent activists, for a variety of reasons, and the British in retrospect, actually see as you know, essentially a, a, a much more confrontational and much more violent element in terms of the path towards independence that could have been managed otherwise. So for that reason, I think this um, uh, the speech of Chang's actually has not a little wisdom in it, even if that wisdom was not particularly uh, noted. Um, he also, um, shortly afterwards, at lunch with Nehru in private, Chiang Kai-shek, um, gave one more little lecture, possibly with the finger wagging to Nehru. He said that the war was indeed an opportunity to create a new anti-imperialist united Asia. And he reminded Nehru in his words that revolutionary opportunities are hard to find and easy to lose. He said this is India's only good revolutionary opportunity. If we lose it, we won't get it again. Uh, he said that Nehru said nothing very much in reply, but uh, he seemed to understand Possibly, uh, possibly so. And eventually, of course, within a few years, um, both Indian independence came to pass, and of course, it uh, became clear that a new emergent 
method of geopolitical discussion was going to emerge. And as I'm sure many of you will have seen, one of the most exciting areas in terms of transnational and comparative history in the present day is the re-examination of what you might call the global south to global south contacts that emerged um, in the late 19th, early 20th century and remain very important during this period and afterwards. The, the whole spirit of Bandung is one of the things that has been uh, um, discussed in some detail in scholarship of recent years. It also has a particular significance, of course, for our own era, where people act as if this is the first time that the BRICS, the non-European world, the global south, has ever had anything to say for itself at all, along with, you know, frankly, overblown, overblown and zero-sum discussions about the disappearance and decline of the West. One of the useful elements, I think, of this kind of uh, comparative historical discussion is to show, first of all, that many of these currents had been emerging for a very long time, and also that these things don't necessarily exist in a zero-sum sort of existence. The rise of China then, as with the rise of China now, does not necessarily mean that the rest of the world is about to disappear under the waves of one of the oceans. And certainly, as we know, in retrospect, the emergence of what was a very real and important set of South-South communications did not, in any sense, immediately uh, portend the uh, uh, disappearance of the existing um, world order. The other element that I'd like to spend just a few minutes talking about before we move to discussion is to turn from the comparative and geopolitical to what you might call the inward and the local, although the two remain very closely connected in many senses. I started with that shot of the DVD showing the history of Chongqing, the temporary wartime Chinese capital during the <coughs> war years. Um, and those who have been to Chongqing and to Sichuan province, which surrounds it, but of course nowadays is separate, will see the way in which a highly locally flavoured history has become part of a whole variety of debates about national and international history, largely because of the changing nature of historical investigation of that period. For a long time, as many here will be aware, it was very difficult, indeed in many cases impossible, to examine the history of Chongqing in wartime. Its archives were closed, the topic itself was seen of minor, as, minor, as of minor importance, simply because the history of the defeated Guomindang government didn't seem to have the kind of significance that was given to the ultimately victorious story that came out of Yan'an, where communists had uh, created a successful um, revolution. And it was only from really the 1990s onwards, and of course the separation of Chongqing into an autonomous um, city in 1996-97 that enabled a new and more locally inflected history to emerge. And many of you will have seen the way in which the wartime experience has been brought into the present day culture of the region. Books such as this one, uh, some of you may have visited the museums run by uh, Fan Chen Chuan, the author of this book, Igar and the Kangran, One Man's, One Person's War of Resistance, which is, for those of you who don't know it, a catalogue of his holdings and memorabilia on the wartime period, which are kept in his museum just outside Chengdu, and which the vast majority of which are uh, commemorations not of the communist effort, but of the nationalist wartime effort, hence this German-style tin helmet, which comes from the troops there. There are plenty of other items too, clothing, ID cards, a whole variety of things. And the reflections that uh, Mr. Fan has uh, put in the book by the side of each of these items provide a very interesting way to show the way in which material culture can be used to try and shape the history of the region in the contemporary era. Another example here, again, book some of you will know, The Great War of Resistance of the People of Sichuan, with a uh, statue of an unknown soldier there, finally giving credit not to um, the uh, national resistance to the Japanese, in this case specifically the resistance of Sichuan province, which feels that its contribution, largely under the Guomindang, of course, had been ignored by the People's Republic for a very long period of that country's history. One other example, again, of a relatively recent, and I found fascinating, uh, book, um, Evacuee 
memoirs, not actually collected really until the 1990s and afterwards, but many of them of now elderly people who had gone as children or young men and women upriver, up the Yangtze to Chongqing. Their stories, because of course they had not made the uh, politically uh, revolutionary move to Yan'an, but instead to the uh, nationalist capital, these stories were not really told or circulated or published in any number until the relative loosening up of the 1990s and, um, and 2000s. And this essentially was a loosening up that enabled a story to be told about Chongqing and its experience in wartime, which again simply hadn't been told in any detail up to that point. Uh, as it happens, Chiang Kai-shek's diaries here do have um, some uh, recollections of the uh, period um, itself. Uh, one of the uh, most um, violent terror bombings that took place in Chongqing was on the nights of May the 3rd and May the 4th of 1939, when Chan remembered that more than 40 enemy planes came to Chongqing today, bombed the areas around the Military Affairs Commission building. A lot of people in the city have been killed and wounded. The next day, with a touch more emotion, uh, <coughs> this is the most terrible thing I've seen in my life. I can't bear to look at it. God lives, why does he not swiftly bring some disaster to our enemy? Again, one of the things that people have noticed about the diaries is actually the very frequent recourse to Christian uh, linguistic usage, which uh, I think people now have come to realize was clearly a lot more important to Chang than we have seen until that, uh, that time. Um, and again, some people have seen, but just to show you a couple of images that were taken by news reporters at the time of the bombing, Chongqing. It's worth remembering quite how heavily bombed the city was between 1938 and 1941 uh, when the uh, air force protection became rather greater. But this moment also had and continues to have significance in terms of the wider trajectory of Chinese history. I said that these big raids happened on the 3rd and 4th of May 1939 and you don't need to know very much Chinese history to recognize that this was of course by no coincidence, the exact 20th anniversary of 4th of May 1919, the great nationalist student demonstration in Beijing, which to this day remains a touchstone for the understanding of Chinese nationhood. And Lao Shi, one of China's great modern novelists, wrote a short piece immediately after the raids in which he said, um, if we are to seize a free liberated idea of May 4th, this nationalist idea of May 4th that continued to be very, uh, very powerful, the idea of science and democracy, then we cannot accept these threats of fire and blood. We must seize with our whole hearts the new life of our great China. Our lives, our struggle, our victory, this is our new May 4th slogan. An interesting statement from an author who is known in some ways for his very despairing and in some ways very bleak view of the possibilities of Chinese nationalism. You need to read his uh, great novellas like um, uh, Mao Chang, uh, Cat Country, to see that he was not terribly hopeful about um, ideas of uh, nation building in the years before the war. But even he, after that air raid, was moved to write in those particular terms. So a very big event that hit the international news as well as being an important part of the local story at that time. And yet, after 1949, of course, really pretty much hidden from public view, giving the local population very little time to analyze, commemorate, or indeed grieve over, over the aftermath of the air raids and leading to um, a whole variety of uh, interrupted stories that were only picked up much later on. Public history in Chongqing has made up for lost time on this. Those who have been to the uh, Three Gorges Museum, uh, which was opened in 2005, will have seen that there are a whole variety of reconstructions of elements of this period. Um, in 2005, um, they opened up a, a reconstruction, a sort of sonne lumiere diorama of the actual bombings of uh, 3rd and 4th May 1939. More recently, a, cre a recreation of another horrific incident, the Sui Dao San An, the, the Great Tunnel Bombing, 5th of June 1941, when hundreds of people were suffocated underground when an air raid shelter uh, uh, collapsed during that, um, during that period. But the emergence of a new approach to an open history of this period has also once again given insights that I think are very relevant for understanding changes in China today. I'll just show you one document that um, I think suggests uh, that. Uh, an document here, not in this case actually from Hoover, 
but from uh, the Chongqing Municipal <coughs> Archives, dealing, as you see, uh, with the um, uh, compensation and damage, uh, sorry, compensation for damage after air raids, uh, destroyed property here, the price of uh, what was lost, uh, and the level of destruction incurred. And just one tiny document as part of a much wider trend that we now know was emerging at that time, the emergence of a much greater sense of mutual obligation and responsibility between state and society in wartime China. Of course, we know that the communists ultimately took this particular trend to its conclusion with a successful revolution. But it's only in recent years that I think we've come to understand that this was not simply an invention of the communists, but rather a series of competing attempts to try and rewrite the social contract in which the Guomindang and the collaborators were um, also involved in different ways. I'm very glad that sitting in the room here we have Dr. Tony Ma about to um, uh, take up a post at the University of Exeter in England. But if you haven't read it, I highly recommend her fantastic article in the latest edition of the European Journal of East Asian Studies, which is on what the nationalist Chinese government thought about the beverage plan. In other words, the great um, British blueprint for social reform that created the UK's welfare state after the war. Now, until telling the family's documents, I doubt that anyone very much knew that the Chinese nationalists thought anything about the beverage plan, let alone actually giving it a great deal of care and attention. I should say that essay sits in um, a, a, a special edited, uh, edited um, edition of the journal, which Helen Schneider and I put together, with a whole variety of essays on relief, rehabilitation, and welfareism in wartime nationalist China, which I think stands as a very interesting contrast to the perhaps better known efforts that we know about the, uh, the communist period at that, uh, at that time. And I would point that out as something of significance today, simply because we all know that social welfare <coughs> continues to be perhaps the single biggest question that faces the Chinese government today. Everything from social discontent to the attempt to bring down inequality is based on the hope and understanding that the government has some possibility of redistributing the wealth that exists in China today more fairly than um, is being done at the moment. And I think it is salutary and important to remember that these are not debates that emerged in 2006 when the current rural pension welfare scheme was put together in China, or indeed in 1949, but have much longer precedence of which this particular set of developments in the wartime period is also an interesting and important um, example. I realize the time is getting on, so I will just leave you with two quick thoughts at the end here, and I hope we can wait for some discussion which is really that, first of all, this seminar, this two-week seminar, is a great delight to be part of, simply because the subject of wartime China as a topic of reinvestigation is so important and deserves a great deal more attention than it's had until quite recently. But also that we should remember that in China in particular, so many of these questions, whether they are geopolitical or domestic, whether they are social or cultural or political, have a great deal of significance in understanding China um, as it sits today. And I'm very pleased to be giving this talk in one particular place, the Hoover Institution, which has done such a very great deal through all of its holdings over the years and decades to enable scholars to make those links between a rigorous examination of the historical past and speculation and analysis about the present and indeed about the future. Thanks very much. Thanks, Professor Miller, for an excellent talk. Um, I think the floor is open.